Eclipse you. You're not eclipsing. <laughs> we can be two moons <laughs> together. Yeah, we're working together. Um, so to everyone on the live stream, hello, everyone in the room. How's it going? Um, yeah, it feels weird to do an introduction with uh, this intimate environment, but thank you to Tyler for, for letting this all happen and the whole crew here. Venture Cafe. Venture Cafe, STL, Midwest Media, we got Chad out there. With, the, with, the, with the sling box, <laughs> yeah. making sure the live stream is operational. Yeah. Very good. You can tune in at Facebook if you uh, go to the biota.club, I believe is the username. Um, yeah, we're super stoked to have this. This is Nina. And you can see we got full <laughs> bleed <laughs> prints. <laughs> Everything's going well. Oh, yeah. Um, I just want to say that we are doing this as a collaboration between Biota, um, which is the name of our event space. That's Riona, Jake, and I. It's down on Laclede's Landing. Uh, it's a platform and event space for experimental music, contemporary electronic music, DJ culture. Um, we named it because of the ecosystem. We're by the river, and the ecosystem of the river is the Biota. Uh, and we think that in a lot of ways this talk kind of plays into the idea that Club culture is its own biota, and maybe at some points it's more fragile than at others, um, but it's prone to a lot of outside influence. Um, but the great thing about it is it's very malleable. Everyone can make it their own. Um, and so Nina was kind enough, even though uh, their sister is graduating, to still come and give this talk with everyone here about, uh, you know, club culture, yeah. the future of club culture, just their experience in so many different positions and a bunch of publications and TFA records. Um, Jake is actually going to be the moderator, though. He's yes. going to step in yes. and get this conversation rolling. So I figure we'll do about 30 minutes of just Q&A, maybe make it more conversational as it goes along, yeah. take some questions, and then go to the live stream at the end. Great. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, for sure. Good. Okay. Okay. Well, hello, Nina. Hey. Um, do you want to just kind of give us a brief rundown about who you are? Yeah. And in the in <laughs> the least weirdest terms. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, I live in Brooklyn, New York. I'm a Leo, so <laughs> let's get that out oh, of the good way. Good to know. All right. um, <laughs> <laughs> Capricorn Moon, okay. hence all of the things that I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, so my right now what I'm doing, my day job is manager of label marketing uh, at DFA Records, which was co-founded by my boss, John Galkin, and James Murphy of LCD Sound System. Um, so that's like a big Ooh. claim to fame, yeah, wow. as well as other bands like Yacht, Holy Ghost, Essay Paw, Gorilla Toss in the more recent years. Um, I've also been freelance writing uh, for the past like three-ish years. Um, I was the bass and club editor at Mixmag for a while and now I'm just freelancing in a bunch of places. Um, what else do I? <laughs> uh, and yeah, I also um, started DJing and at college when I was at school and now run a night in Brooklyn as well. Nice. Um, so yeah, let's start with, you know, because I think a lot of these are electronic based, if you will, um, or they could be, you know, or big positions or big places in that. Um, what what was your like initial foray into electronic music? What What's piqued your interest in it? Yeah, so I feel like every person who, or I feel this way, at least a lot of writers now are like, yeah, I was listening to Aphex Twin when I was 15, got into <laughs> Burial, was just like buying all these records. I was listening to like exclusively uh, indie guitar music oh, in yeah. high school. Um, <laughs> and up until probably I was like, maybe it was my freshman or sophomore year of college and it was through probably Tumblr um, and acts like Young Lean um, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, and niche stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> Young Lean, who's all of his records still really go off, I think. <laughs> but so it was through sort of like that realm of production that I probably got into the more like electronic side of things, primarily through SoundCloud um, and sort of regional, various regional club musics um, that was really taking off around like 2015, 16, I think, though other people would say earlier. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that's sort of how I got into it. I was. When I first started going out, 
I was studying in London and I was having sort of a tough time mental health wise and I felt like when I went out and danced at these like random basements to this sort of like abrasive scary music that (laughs) it was the time where like my mind and body could align instead of feeling so disjointed like it did most of the time and so I think that was probably my big entry point into all of that. Well because I feel like yeah for most people it's like it has to be fun it is fun and that's like the I feel like so many people get into the, like the politics or the uh, esotericness of electronic music at some point, but it's like it's just fun at some point, it you is. know. And that's that's clearly an example of that. Um, and then now, as a DJ yourself, how did you first get into DJing? Where did you kind of start with that? And like maybe what kind of music were you playing out? Um, and the kind of trajectory to maybe where you are today? Yeah, sure. Uh, so. Uh, I started DJing uh, at my third year in school after listening to music like this for a couple years. I was like, I would like to mix it and play it out and because the feeling of like seeing people dance to like something you're doing like that, that's almost as good as like dancing yourself, you know, Um, if not better. I don't know. There's no hierarchy to it. (laughs) But um, so I got a controller um, and Serato and just started messing around. And then when I was away and didn't have my controller, I was ma- manually matching waveforms on Ableton between wow. tracks wow. and like cutting <laughs> like cutting bits of tracks to like loop it uh, as a manual loop sort of and got really into it. That was like exclusively like SoundCloud club music probably. Yeah. Um, and so then when I came back, we were lucky enough to have the infrastructure at our school. Um, I went to Stri- Scripps College in Claremont, California, but it's part of the Claremont Consortium, which is four other colleges. Um, and we had this party every Tuesday night called Table Manners, where we had CDJs, which are the digital decks that you use to um, DJ, and we could just like mess around and play whatever we wanted. No one would come, but it was <laughs> it was a Tuesday also, and the school yeah. was not super into it. <laughs> but uh, but we could mess around, and so I knew that after I left, you know, with the New York scene, like it doesn't really feel like there's any niche to be filled. There's so many great people doing great things there, but my thing is like I always want to put my friends on. They always deserve to be yeah. put on, and so. That's that's how I started the night, and I feel like what I DJ now is some amalgamation of the harder, scarier stuff that I was DJing before, as well as um, just your more... I got an education in house and techno, definitely, through working at DFA, and I really appreciate that from them. Definitely. Yeah. Well, and I... I I don't remember if you said that in your intro or if we were talking before this, but you're from Chicago, yes. from mid- the Midwest, and we are also in the Midwest. Um, obviously, Chicago and being like one of the homes of house, if you will, <laughs> pardon the pun, um, how would you say, <laughs> yeah, the house of house, yes. there is. <laughs> we went there. Um, how would you say that... Um, and this, this is, I think, kind of like the getting to like the meat of the conversation. I think can, we can break this up in a lot of little, little parts, but like, um, I guess without it sounding like chip on your shoulder Midwestern, like how yeah. would you say like being from the Midwest has influenced, obviously you went to school in California, you now live in New York, like not only your approach to say music, but also your interest in music, and eventually we'll talk about what needs to come to the Midwest that you're using. Yeah. Um... I didn't go out in Chicago until I was 21, and I'm not just saying that. Yeah. <laughs> um, to the but, kids out there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but it was primarily because um, I didn't get into electronic music until I was in college, and then I was, you know, not home that often. And um, so when I did go out in Chicago the first time, it was at the tail end of that year where. Ele- <sighs> This is so hackneyed, but like, I feel like that year in 2016, I feel like electronic music did sort of save my life a little bit without those moments of like sanity on the dance floor. I wouldn't have as much to cling to. Um, And so that is at the tail end of that year that I went out in Chicago for the first time and I went to Smart Bar, which is Chicago's premier electronic music (laughs) venue. And um, it was really welcoming. Something I like about the scene in Chicago now uh, that I've realized is that it's super queer, um, and I really appreciate that. And it's sort of effortlessly that, too, as well. There's a lot of people doing really cool stuff. As far as being from the Midwest, I think something that I carry um, with me 
throughout stuff is like how important one's local community is and how you should always be doing more to put your local community onto a bigger awareness and uh, while like sort of nurturing the spirit of like the, the close-knit tidness <laughs> of, uh, of, of your scene. Yeah. Okay, because I, I would say that's, that's something that I hear a lot. Like I had a friend that went to Wash U uh, who's from New York originally, I grew up in New York, and um, she would talk about how, like, for instance, the Black Lives Matter chapters of New York uh, would, would have a hard time kind of connecting with one another because the city's just so big, there's so many mm. people, whereas here she felt that that the community was just one big one here. You know, and it's a smaller city, that's going to happen, but, um, you know, perhaps there's even, to some degree, like, uh, a more a community-based mindset of the Midwest, would you say that? Or is, is I mean, community, you know, I, I think of, you know, is, is ubiquitous across the world, but um, is, do you feel like community, the emphasis on community is something inherently Midwestern, or, or do you mm. think you've seen that around the world? I feel like I haven't spent quite enough time as, like, someone going out in Chicago to be able to speak for that on the Chicago scene. Yeah. However, what I will say in New York, I think there's a really nurturing community of uh, DJs who are just starting out because the infrastructure club-wise, like actual venue space is there. Though things move around and get shut down, I feel like there's a lot of a local spirit. Whereas for example, my friend is a DJ in London and she says it's everyone's like fighting for the same bookings. It's really hard to like, you know, get your first like five gigs or whatever. Um, and people don't want to take a chance. And so I definitely feel like New York has that spirit a lot too. Um, I can't speak, yeah, yeah. I, I don't feel like I could speak <laughs> sure, to anywhere yeah. else, but okay. the, that to me is something that stands out about New York too very much. Yeah. Okay, because I'll say like in St. Louis that um, a lot of, like I'll, I'll quote uh, a local artist, Tonina, um, amazing singer bassist in town um, and the quote she said recently was uh, at, at one of her shows was like just always go out and support local music because we have the talent but we just don't have the infrastructure mm -hmm. and so with St. Louis is that it's 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 not so much that like the chances aren't there it's just that uh, they haven't been made in some way that's like it's hard to break into existing as much as it's we have to build it ourselves which I think some people find to be an opportunity that's really exciting yeah um, and that's certainly something I feel like we have uh, with Biota um, but at the same time it can also be frustrating to try to get people kind of interested or involved with these things um, or let alone just get the word out you know um, so I think uh, I guess and, you know, but uh, you're kind of experiencing in New York, like you're saying, clubs are kind of shutting down left and right, depending on the month or something. Yeah. We, we worked with a visual artist for one of our nights that said um, he went to school in New York, and he said like every time he would visit or like go away for the summer and come back, like venue spaces that were there would be gone within those three months or something. Yeah. Um, is is there any way that you feel like people in New York are trying to combat that, or like what what's is there any like sort of new approach in your mind to try to be like how do we keep places around or what what what's what are some methods that we can try to keep these going so i think a big win big win for the <laughs> nightlife community in new york was the repeal of the cabaret law which okay. happened the fall before last i believe um and basically ugh, i'm gonna embarrassingly not get this right uh, but <laughs> it was basically outlawing the number of people like you couldn't you couldn't have like a dance floor or a dance space over a certain number of people legally unless you had this license which was very hard to get purposefully and very few venues especially like the venues that I would be going to or that anyone would be going to like had that and it was basically the law was basically created um, during prohibition as like a racist law to keep like people from gathering and dancing and having a good time so yeah, that got repealed, and that was amazing <laughs> uh, because it was just, I think, a big step forward. And that was cool because uh, Frankie DeKaiza Hutchinson of Disc Woman, which is this New York-based platform that spotlights um, basically like women and trans talent, I would say, um, she was involved with that, as was Councilman Rafael Espinal. So that was really sick that we had a councilman who was like going up against everything for that and it sort of was like beautiful in that regard so that was I think a very like concrete example of like organizing and stuff Frankie also now books at Bossa Nova Civic Club which is a 
techno institution <laughs> in Brooklyn, um, which is really sick. There's this bar, Mood Ring, which is where I throw my night. That's just opened up like a year or so ago. Like QPOC owns like very sick people involved and very solid crowd. Um, so it doesn't make me despair. Super, there will always be like warehouse shows yeah. as well. Given all this, though, I only moved to New York um, a few years ago, okay. and I also don't feel like I had the history to sort of speak to what happened before, though I know of venue closures like Death by Audio and 285 Kent, which is like primarily um, DIY, like rock, but not always uh, spaces, and that closed out in Williamsburg, and then Vice moved into their offices. <laughs> um, so it's definitely sort of a longer trajectory than I think okay. what I can get at here. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah. Well, and, and I'd say, like, I think those might be kind of, like, ubiquitous issues, perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, just, and then there'll be different versions, like, there's only so much island in New York at some point, and <laughs> as money increases, that they're going to just wipe out these DIY spaces, and I think it's part of DIY culture is that, like, you enjoy the moment while you have it, because most DIY spaces inherently only last so long, um, especially ones that I think are maybe pushing the limit or, or in, you know, in varying ways of legally operating you know yeah, so yeah. that like they can only be going there for so long um let's kind of switch gears here um to your actual like djing today um like what would you say your approach approach to it as curation because that's something i think we talk about a lot is that like djing is not just like oh just play some tracks whatever like you're you're you're, you're curating a room uh sonically and you're you're creating space where you know you want to have those moments to transfer you know, maybe this is a very dad statement. I don't know. Like, what's what you kids do are important. Um, but I guess what what is your what is your approach to it? Like, what do you what do you feel like you bring to the decks when you when you get up there? Yeah. So when we were putting on nights at school, I will say the dynamic was completely different. The school was giving us money. Granted, not a lot of money, but yeah. hmm, more money than I have now to spend on trading nights. Um, so that was that was really exciting because. We were the organization that ran it. They gave us X amount of money, and we did with that whatever we wanted, which was bring people that we liked who happened to be coming through LA um, or thereabouts uh, to put on to the larger student body. So that was cool because I feel like we kind of took the approach that was like, we want to share something that we like that's sort of fringe compared to the rest of the school with y'all. And sometimes people came, and sometimes they yeah, do not. Right. And so back and forth uh, with the night. So me and my friend Ethan, um, who moved away from New York at the end of uh, last summer, but we started the night together originally. And it's called Intimist, and it's basically a place for people of like various marginalized communities to come and enjoy the dance floor um, and to sort of like pull from like Jose, Jose Munoz a little bit to like celebrate the here, but also the not yet here. So not dance floor as escape, um, but rather dance floor as like acknowledgement of present while also looking towards the future. Um, that is all Munoz and none of that is me. Yeah. <laughs> really good stuff that everyone yeah, should yeah, read. Sure. Um, but yeah, so we started the night. I feel like the impetus was mostly to just put our friends on, like I said before. like. The first night that we ever did was Kieran Loftus from Philly, a uh, false witness from New York, and our friend Luke, hello DJ, from LA, who I actually wanted to big up Luke Kim for a second, <laughs> who completely revitalized the LA electronic scene in the past two or so years. It's like pretty incredible to watch what they're doing all the time. Yay, Luke. Right. <laughs> um, but so we had all three of them play, which really worked well together, um, sort of intense. And then I think from there, it was definitely like, okay, like who's around, whose music will go well. The night I threw last weekend uh, was sort of like a hard, harder core <laughs> night uh, with Kilborn and Sue Baycall and Princess Peggy, um, all living in New York right now, all good locals who sort of go really hard. Okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was cool to, the thing about having the party at Moodering is that it's on a stretch in Brooklyn, where it's Saturday night, people will be out there regardless of the music. And I think that's cool in itself that people, I mean, drunk people will be drunk people, <laughs> but everyone wants to dance regardless of if it's like chill house or like banging hardcore yeah, right. or like whatever. Um, so that's, yeah, I guess that would be it. Okay, yeah. And so, like, and so then even like even a little more micro, like your DJ sets in particular, like, what is there like, do you, what's kind of your, 
approach to your DJ set itself. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, I don't believe in building. <laughs> I believe in getting in there, like, hot, yeah. kind of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as I was speaking to y'all before this, um, I feel like I started out, my entry point was very sort of, like, not super fast, but very hard, very, like... <sighs> I don't want to talk about the term deconstructed club because <laughs> it's very fraught and it, um, for those not familiar with the term, it's sort of a catch-all for music that was popular on SoundCloud 2014, 2016, lots of glass shattering, lots of gunshots, <laughs> lots of like pulling from various regional club genres, sort of like appropriation and reappropriation of certain sounds. Um, and a lot of that was sort of definitely taken to excess, but I definitely like the potentialities for hardness that stuff like that offered. And then I feel like now, um, I don't know, I really, I'm really into corny dance tracks, not like, not like, you know, Diplo or someone like that, <laughs> but I'm really into, uh, like, for example, Tech House, which has, like, a very obvious 4-4 big kick, yeah. and, like, often a sample of a British man talking about going to the club and taking all sorts of drugs, and I find that hilarious and really fun to play, yeah. regardless of, you know, what's going on with you, and so, um, whatever, whatever triggers, I think, the most visceral reaction in people yeah. is what I want uh, a lot of trend of deconstructed club that I think is a good longevity piece of it is uh, sort of like remixes of big pop songs um, and as you can imagine that can get a little trite sometimes sure. but like if people do it correctly you know I think I prepped one for tomorrow night um, yes. this Vancouver producer Baby Blue has a track <laughs> that um, Madonna song like you know that oh, <laughs> like music yeah. brings the people together that yes. song that Madonna yes. does and just puts like a big gabber kick on it All for right. stuff like that that's what I like cool. <laughs> that's what I try to put out there All right. well, so, we're literally just like a gorgeous okay. track. I downloaded specifically for this night. So. Yeah, so quick side note, we do have a show. Nina's playing. Uh, we'll have this uh, up for a while if you want to talk, whatever you've got posters to. Um, so there's a kind of a follow-up event tomorrow night down at our venue uh, the, uh, called Biota. It's on the Cleats Landing. And we'll have locals Grim Dollar Gray and Mordak playing. Uh, then uh, Biota Us will be DJing as well, uh, kind of closing out the night. So that'll be tomorrow night. Quick plug there. Um, so we just zoomed in real close, or real in for like your sets, literally, and then we'll zoom way out. Uh, obviously, you are a journalist, a curator, uh, and in marketing, um, and a DJ. So how would you say these positions kind of work to influence one another? And mm. would you say like what is what it like? What do you believe the role is of, of each? Hmm. I Very broad. no, that's good. <laughs> I'm glad that you asked that. Uh, I could talk a lot of shit here, and sorry, if, maybe I shouldn't say that. Uh, 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 hmm. it's yeah, it's Facebook, uh, but I won't do that because I want to keep all my jobs. Okay. Uh, but I primarily think that when people, what the music industry should be about. Maybe this is idealistic. I did watch Almost Famous as a child. <laughs> so sue me, I'm sorry. Yeah. But I think your passion for music and the artist should really be what drives you. Everything should be catered toward putting the artist on this person who deserves success. And that shouldn't always be like white techno dudes from Germany. It should be like obviously every, everyone. And that's what we should work towards making the music industry at the end of the day just not like this monolith but rather a plethora of talent and background and situation and sound and I sort of try to go into all of these things I guess with that in mind though sometimes easier said than done I feel like I'm most directly able to affect that when DJing or curating my night I can play tracks by people I like and everyone has to hear that and I can play um, and I can book people and I say here like I really like your work let me give you money so that you can share your work with people because like when it comes down to it like redistribution of resources is the thing that helps people keep doing what they're doing um, with marketing at DFA I feel that is that is sometimes a challenge, you know. Uh, marketing is hard. It's definitely like more playing the game 
um, but to good end results. So that can be, you know, nothing is ever cut and dried, <laughs> but uh, I would say that it's given me a lot of ideas about how to put on people in the future outside of sort of the hard lines of the industry and working at a record label uh, with constraints. And then with journalism, uh, I would say this is where it gets really tricky <laughs> because I think a lot of journalists like to paint themselves as sort of a god figure. This is what the artist meant. This is what it is. I'm going to give them a bad review because this is how I feel about it and that deserves to be out there. And to that I say, if you're not ch constantly checking yourself as a role of the critic, like, I don't know. Sometimes I feel, in honesty, sometimes I feel underqualified to be speaking about the music that I like. I don't have background in a lot of things. For example, like really intense noise music that I like to listen to. I don't have a huge, you know, back catalog knowledge of that. Or even just, you know, most genres in general. Mm -hmm. But I think what's also important too is to be like, my, you know, I'm not God. My taste isn't everything or anything. And so I try, if I don't like an album, I try not to write about it. There's people who will do that. It doesn't have to be me. Um, I feel this way, uh, I feel like people can be like, oh, you have an agenda with what you write about. And it's like, yeah, of course I do. <laughs> like, Someone can write about those artists. It's not going to be me. Even if I like that music, I would rather put on people who aren't getting put on that I care about. Right. Um, and so I feel like music journalism is hard because it lends itself to clickbait and ad revenue and stuff like that. But I think she's sort of, I don't know, this is hard. It's easy also for me to say as a freelancer rather than a staff writer where you're sort of beholden to the publication that you write for and your views are kind of theirs regardless of whether you want that to be or not. Um, I have a lot more <laughs> things I could say about music journalism, but we can cut it cut it there. Well, if you want to, you can. Maybe later. Maybe okay. later. We'll okay. That's yeah. fine. That's cool uh, because we can definitely go further than I had questions about it. We can wait. Um, so uh, let's get back into kind of like shows again for a sec. Um, like, what do you feel that, like, since you've, you've booked shows clearly, but then you're also DJing, so you're on kind of your own on both sides, the artist, the curation for both sides. Um, what's what, what responsibilities do you think that DJs have to their scenes? Mm -hmm. and, and then you being in both positions, what do you feel then the booking end you mm -hmm. have as a responsibility to, uh, to, to the public yeah. with your events? I think, I think DJs, uh, especially in the U.S., where electronic music is still far more fringe compared to, like, excuse me, Europe. Sorry, <laughs> this beer. Yeah. What can I say? <laughs> um, <laughs> compared to, you know, like dance culture in Europe is very different. And I think DJs should always be championing their local scene. That's where they came from. That's who's going to give them the come up, usually. Although, actually, sometimes you think about, you know, for example, I uh, was very lucky to be able to go to Krakow in the fall and go to Unsound Festival, which is this like very, very cutting edge experimental music festival that takes place throughout various venues throughout Krakow uh, in a museum, in an abandoned hotel, in an underground club, like very crazy stuff. Um, and that festival is funded 50%, perhaps more, by the city government. Wow. That would never happen here. Yeah. That would never happen here, but those, you know, people who are putting that uh, fest on, shout out to them, very cool people, um, they will look at the regional scenes of the U.S. and say, like, look, who can we share with our scene in Krakow, and who can we fly out and pay and have them share their music with us? Um, so sometimes it is, especially here, people getting put on internationally a lot before their local scene. That being said, I don't know. I think DJs should always be asking for more because DJs are fucking great and <laughs> usually <laughs> I, uh, yeah um, and so I don't know who they have a responsibility to necessarily I think just like be a nice person and remember sorry um, where you came from is always a good rule of thumb it's, even if we're from where you came from was people from abroad putting you on at first you know yeah. um, and then as a promoter I feel that's probably where I get to feel myself a little bit. And um, say, you all out there, 
deserve to hear my friends yes. and how good they right. sound. And so I think that's probably what, gotcha. what I would say. Well, and um, I think that, you know, so like being, I think on either side of that, it can be kind of hard because it's like, you obviously as a, as a curator want to put on for artists and do as much as you can. But then, you know, there are times when maybe people do less than what you want or are less than reliable. Um, but I, I think is you do you feel it's like end of the day obviously it's always going to be worth it in that case like like money comes into mind and like mm. you're like having to like figure out things with that or figure out things with venues like mm. how do you how do you keep sane I guess in those in those regards yeah I'm very lucky to have had the experiences booking that I've had at school we had a venue though that sort of was complicated our last year of school um, when they took the venue that we had previously been using and shut it down and made it storage without consulting any of us um, and made us move to a space that had a history of frankly like stuff that was triggering for a lot of people so we had to navigate around that um, but financially luckily it was never an issue at school now I feel very lucky because at the bar that I throw shows at there's no cover and we get paid out of the bar it's very wow sick in that regard yeah, that's a, um, that's so sweet deal yeah it, it really is and again shout out vanessa and bowen from mood ring y'all rock ring. Um, right. yes exactly um i know it definitely gets a lot more complicated when other financial aspects come into play um and that's something i'd like to work more on too like more high stakes shows bringing in people that i think are really cool we'll get to that <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I'm personally how I stay sane is I can't let myself have any free time because <laughs> then we spiral. But uh, I feel you. I feel you majorly. So it's I just to like stay to, busy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> busy. That's what I would say. Um, well, I, I think I'll do like one more question, um, and then we should I think open it up uh, to everyone here. Um, and this will be literally uh, kind of like the uh, title track of it is. The future, mm. the future of club culture. Um, who do you feel are some examples? Uh, you can also say yourself if you want to, or your friends or whoever. Yeah. Uh, in terms of like people that are pushing genres, people that are doing awesome parties, like anything in the world of electronic music or club culture that you think is just like people need to know about this. Yeah. In, in your experience, since you've obviously traveled the world and seen stuff, you know, of all these things. Yeah. What 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 would you tell to the people out there to check out? Yeah, cool. So I can't shout out Disc Woman enough. Really cool uh, platform, collective booking agency that centers women and trans talent, essentially. Um, and that's super sick. Uh, <laughs> um, that sounds essentialist that I said that but I guess it's more likely women and non-binary people sure. than the, we know what I mean language yeah. is a trip sometimes um, I also want to shout out Club Chai in the Bay Area really cool party and label run by Bolentina and Fuzel in Oakland that's super sick they're putting on a lot of good people bringing in a lot of cool people also want to shout out the Mutualism crew from the north of England, from Manchester and Leeds. They're keeping that club spirit alive from like 2016 that got me into it in the first place, I would say. That's like Loft, she's amazing. Uh, BFTT, Clemency, y'all are doing great things there. <laughs> um, in terms of people and in terms of yeah, and to people that I don't know who are just like struggling to start their shit and make their scene sit up and take notice of what's going on around them and like trying to bring people into the scene from disparate places, I feel like that's... Oh, I also want to shout out Midwest in training crew from Cleveland, I believe, doing really cool like um, house stuff. I'm sure there's like so much more I could say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but maybe if I think on it i'll bring for it sure yeah, yeah yeah anytime just just interrupt literally anyone like, <laughs> this is the thing um yeah. and maybe we can put some links or something eventually yeah sure sure, sure. Be down. um but yeah i'm gonna go ahead and open the floor up to anyone here um any questions for nina uh, i got a question so like um what is the aspect of this whole thing right now because i was told like um, that it's like the dj thing because 
Me personally, I'm building a, a plasma arc speaker pretty much it's a high voltage energy transformer for this stable ion. It's actually a speaker to you put your phone up to it. Whoa. And it produces a, a, a positive o, ozone that can heal the parasympathetic nervous system and it's got health benefits as well. So I came to like try to connect with people that like that can help me do that because pretty much all the, the inventory is in Hong Kong and uh, we can like get get it off Amazon and then just like bring it here and just sell it out. I got like a lot of clientele that would pretty much like to buy. I'm also an artist myself so I I'm not even here for the artist stuff though. Yeah, yeah. It seems like there's a lot of artists here. <laughs> Yeah, we should, we should talk afterwards because uh, there's some people that you should probably get introduced to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. John Phillips. Yeah. Yeah. But this is more like uh, music, club culture, yeah. talking about journalism, being a DJ, uh, yeah. you not keep people together on the dance floor. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I actually like throw events too. Like, I got an event at the Omega Center Saturday. So um, I'm an artist myself as well. And um, I feel like yeah, we actually need more people like that are aware of Tesla technology, if mm -hmm. you ever heard of it. So, um, pretty much what it does is it, it's a healing, has a healing benefits with the speaker that I'm talking about. So I was, my, my ultimate plan was like to get the plasma speaker and then play my own personal music off of mm -hmm. it and like shoot videos with it because instead of an actual physical diaphragm, it's a high voltage uh, that is creating that pressure wave. So it's Interesting. It's really neat once you see it. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to check that An out. An artist that comes to mind also is Aisha Devi, uh, who put out this really cool album, I want to say last year or the year before, that involved all these crazy, like, sine waves and, like, theta waves. And I don't know about all of that, certainly. But the way it was explained to me was, like, when she gets to play this out on these, like, crazy sound systems around the world, like, the best sound systems in the world, like, hearing those waves uh, at that, I guess, uh, quality, like the frequency, something about the frequency is also like very physically embodied and healing. Yeah. And then she talked about like, um, like throat singing and the certain way of breathing that yeah. goes through Honestly, you. When you... Like the unified field theory is what I just said pretty much. Yeah. And it's electromagnetism, how like the body and everything technology, Bluetooth, radiation, all that associates with this. So like you can heal the body with a body symmetry, you know. That's so People sick. Reading techniques like to bed the month. I mean, yeah. But actually they use that doesn't cut. I don't I don't I try not to I cut, but I try not to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sick. Um so as a uh, manager of the labor market for DFA, how does that kind of translate to your work promoting and just kind of what are some of the, the hurdles that you have as a marketing manager? Yeah. Um, Sorry, just before you answer, uh, we'll make sure that we repeat the questions to those streaming. Oh, yeah. So if we could just repeat the question just before answering going yeah. forward. Um, so how, is, how has DFA influenced uh, marketing? I'm sorry, say it again. <laughs> how, how has your experience uh, as a label marketer, uh, I guess, helped you when it comes to being a promoter? And then secondly, the follow-up is, what are some of the hurdles that you have when it comes to marketing artists that are a part of the label? Yeah. Cool. Um, so I would say with my own promotion and marketing, it's on a much smaller scale uh, than DFA. So there's not a ton I feel that crosses over, but that's honestly sort of freeing in a way because I can just brand it however I want to brand it. Whereas, you know, at work you're doing what, like, uh, sort of within the brand of the company. Um, and then I guess sort of the hurdles that I would face day to day, I mean... The, the music industry is like a dying business because records are at least the independent music industry I would say and DFA is an independent label no affiliations with majors or anything like that um, so but still the main source of our revenue is merch sales and specifically like vinyl record sales and obviously in the, the age of streaming um, <laughs> if you want to read cool stuff about streaming and how it's bad Liz Pelly, writing for The Baffler, and David Turner, um, who does a newsletter called Penny Fractions every Wednesday. It's Good to check out. Saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that being said, I will say 
press has like a huge impact on whether or not people buy records. For example, Elato Negro uh, just had a cool record that got put on by like the New York Times. And so that was like, I think a big cool thing for independent record labels like Revenge, his label. Um, then being a journalist, I'm like, that's hard too because I want to, again, like, I want people to get money so they can keep making the music and stuff. So I try to use my like journalist knowledge going into like how we market things specifically, but sometimes I feel I feel very at a loss because I'm like, I like this record that we're putting out. Why is no one talking about it? And I think it just shows sort of like the whims of music journalism and how like fickle music journalism as like a structure and entity and the writers themselves, no names, uh, can be. <laughs> Um, but that's just that's just the internet and exponential decay and all of that. Um, I don't know. I would say sometimes it feels like I could be doing more, but I'm but I'm at a loss and I don't really know how to get there because Tifa is quite small. There's not a lot of like infrastructure that I can turn to. Um, to be like, oh, what if we tried this, this, and this? And it's like, I think we have to be a bit more deliberate in like what we, what we do because of you know maybe not having as many resources as like a bigger label. So, so can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. To that? Um, given that that is a, a smaller, independent label, um, how have the label or, or you being a part of the marketing department uh, figured out creative ways to like I guess apply DIY tactics and strategies mm -hmm. towards those releases? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I was, no, 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 no. I was just thinking that's that's something I wish that we implemented more. I think the one the one band that comes to mind is Gorilla Toss, who started, you know, more than six years ago, <laughs> sometime approximately more than six years ago, <laughs> as like a noise band in Boston and came from this very heavily DIY scene and then got sort of weirder and poppier as it went on from that. And so they are a huge touring band. They're, I believe, on like their first Europe tour right now, and they're constantly touring the US. And so that, I think, is like an amazing DIY mindset. Touring is like really grueling. Like it's, it's really rough, but like I believe, I do believe that that is like, you know, anyone who's grown up in the Midwest <laughs> <laughs> knows a friend who just like kicked around in a van for a month uh, touring randomly and staying in people's couches and like playing in their basements and stuff like that. And so I think the ethos of actual like DIY bands, um, for great, uh, Girl Toss also has a big crossover with like jam bands, like Grateful Dead and stuff like this. <laughs> I'm not a huge Grateful Dead fan, but I know that like the power of that sort of fandom. And so we make some like dead adjacent merch and stuff like that <laughs> for DFA. And I think just like, yeah, cool stuff like that, like merch, like bootlegging merch or merch that looks bootlegged is really sick. Um, and I just think on a larger scale, it's hard to apply those DIY tactics because I think the benefit of DIY is that everyone knows that they're, not the benefit, but I think someone, People involved in DIY stuff know that they're not doing it for the money, usually, whereas a record label is always doing it for the money, unless it's, you know, your friend's label and not your full-time job or something like that. But, um, so it's tricky, but bands like Gorilla Toss, keeping that alive, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions here? Um, yeah, from the, from the perspective, back to the same label marketing perspective, but also from the fact that you're in New York and like in the scene and everything. What do you think the disconnect is between Europe in particular and North America, especially with electronic music, especially with like house and techno too? I feel like you have like DFA and you have like Ghostly and you have a couple bigger indies like that that do more edgy stuff, yeah. but we, the US doesn't really have like a defected or a tool room mm -hmm. or a drum code or compact. Where, where, where is the dis, what, what's the missing link? To, to help change that culture? Is it the radio or the labels or the DSPs or the, the yeah. clubs or what? This is something I've thought a lot about too and not something that I have, I think, sort of a fully formed answer to. I will say that there is a history um, because I think dance music in the U.S. has always been seen as more fringe, whether that's because pirate radio is way was or is. Mm, I don't want to make grand generalizations, but they have, you know, they have like NTS 
London-based radio station pretty big. They have Red Light Radio in Amsterdam. They have Berlin Community Radio that's shutting down. But um, sort of this pirate radio, I think, uh, a more lax approach to drugs and drinking, certainly, uh, which is a big part of electronic music, regardless of how we feel about that or not. Like, undeniably, in the history, that's there. Um, and... I'm not sure what it what it is, and it dates it dates far back. But yeah, I I wish there was more like structural support for the arts and for electronic music here. I think sort of a devaluation of the arts that's particular to the United States, um, especially like literal devaluation and like defunding of arts programs in schools, all the way up to like cities are actively trying to shut down venues rather than you know, funding a whole festival that draws people and that, I don't know if they make money back on on sound, but, but I think it's certainly like a prioritization matched with uh, a very particular history, but I don't know the genesis of, you know, why, you know, there was this huge, like, acid house stone roses crossover in like the late 80s like i'm i'm not sure of the history of that and would like to learn more certainly yeah, just curious, just curious your, your perspective on yeah it. yeah that's that's what i got probably <laughs> yeah uh have you been met with any like resistance in like getting giving voices to like more marginalized people like uh when promoting online have you run into like much yeah just resistance in that I yeah so I can repeat the question just resistance about uh promoting like more marginalized people who aren't put on as often um I think in New York I'm really lucky it's super welcoming in the scene that I'm in and the scene that I'm in but like I think I don't know if I feel qualified to say that I again I haven't been there that long but um I think that's really welcoming I think where I got the most pushback was sort of in the journalism aspect because it's like what's going to get us clicks you know and I've been really privileged to work with some like amazing editors who love taking chances on new shit but at the same time like structurally um for example like I used to intern at the fader for a summer and that was sick and then they fired all of their editorial staff and no one uh who I worked with is there anymore um, which is crazy, but I think when push came to shove, it's run by an ad agency, Cornerstone Media. It's not a conspiracy, <laughs> I promise. Um, but I just feel bad because this was a platform that was championing, I mean, big artists like, uh, you know, when I was there, like Ray Stremmer was on the cover, but championing smaller artists just via like track premieres. And I guess the time ran out on that. And the people at the top are like, sorry, we got to make money. And I'm like, well, you already have a lot of money. You could have stood to, to, do, to do this. But, yeah, it's tricky. Um, I'll say quickly, we have about 11 minutes left. Um, and give everyone a little bit of time to maybe move to the next thing. Um, so take maybe one or, one or two more questions. Let's see. Let's see. Quickly, we have been live streaming. We'll see if uh, any comments. Uh, no comments. But <laughs> <laughs> this is our first time. That's so good. We appreciate it, everyone who's watching uh, at home. Um, Now's your chance. Yeah. Now's my chance. Is that, is that Neen? Is that how you pronounce yeah. that? Yeah. Neen. Mm -hmm. like <laughs> FKA Nina No Chill. Yes. But uh, Neen now, yes. Yeah. So I'm a new artist, let's say. Like, finished an album and actually know somebody, um, what's your advice for, you know, for artists getting started? How can you help promote me? How can you help <laughs> yeah. a star? Yeah. <laughs> how, can, how can we help new artists uh, get the coverage that they deserve and get the gigs that they deserve? <sighs> from a, I think I'll speak to this most from like a journalistic standpoint because, um, yeah, I, I don't feel like involved in booking enough uh, for that framework, but I will say, like, it's really hard because, like, people send you a lot of emails <laughs> when you write for places, and you just kind of have to click past sometimes. But this is where I feel music journalists, I think the level I'm at, like, I'm not getting so many emails where I can't look at them, um, so I try to, like, you know, look at everything and see if it's, like, 
worth do, working with, but, you know, for the artists that are, like, on staff at Rolling Stone or what have you, um, I feel like they get too much to read, like, themselves. And that, I've also wondered that, too, because I'm, like, you don't have the res- resources for a PR agency. Like, what are, you, what are you going to do in that regard? I think just a well-placed email that's sort of, like, not too... Uh, I guess, like, just like, hey, here's my music. I don't even feel like really doing yeah, this. How often do you get people that are sending you music and do you have time to even listen to it? Yeah. People send, people send me their music and I feel like at least I try to skim through it. But <laughs> I don't know. I feel like a lot of journalists have very different opinions about this. Someone uh, had a thread recently that was like, if you just send me an email, I'm not going to look at it. You basically need a PR agency or else you're screwed. And I don't believe that's the end-all, be-all answer. I do believe that there is a way around that. What that is, I'm not quite sure. I think it's just a general less jaded mindset (laughs) maybe that people could have. But I know there's people working hard and championing stuff that deserves to be championed that also don't have time to do all of that. So, yeah, again, this is something I think a lot about, but I don't have a... I have a big answer as I wish I did. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think we've. Uh, five minutes to move out. Yeah, so I just, I think uh, we'll wrap it up there. Um, so we'll say, let's do a big round for Nina here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for being here. Yeah, um, quick you. plug, though, uh, Nina will be performing uh, tomorrow night uh, at Biota, which is downtown in Laclede's Landing. Um, if you find Biota on Facebook, again, it's B-I-O-T-A, um, you'll be able to find the Facebook event. We have we'll ticket information. Uh, we have it on Instagram, too, biota.club, if you want to follow us along. I have a sign-up sheet if you want to be on the mailing list. We can pass that around. Yes. Yeah, we've, we've got different, lots of ways different to get avenues. Avenues. We are at the Venture Cafe, after all. We need to <laughs> yeah, keep in connect. touch with everyone. So, um, yeah, thank you all so much for being here.